Hello, friends. Welcome to our special baptismal service. The in-person service is hosted by Tiverton Baptist Church, and we hope this pre-recorded online service will be a blessing to you as well. Baptism is a special time, and Pastor John Luke will have more information about that in a moment. But before we begin the service, we have just a few announcements. Next week's service, that is August the 8th, will be an outdoor service provided the weather cooperates. The service will be taking place near Paisley. If you need any directions, do not hesitate to contact Pastor John Luke or a board member. If you would like to stay after the service for a little time of gathering, feel free to bring a bagged lunch as we enjoy God's wonderful creation together. This baptism service is also a communion Sunday. Please have your communion emblems ready as we partake together. And now, Pastor John Luke has a special announcement as well before we begin the service. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday, August the 1st. I have an extra special announcement before we begin our special baptismal service. We will be having some joint worship sessions with Tiverton Baptist Church. Well, an open invitation <laughs> to them. We'll see what they say. On September the 12th and September the 19th. That will be the second and the third Sunday in September. So you can bookmark those dates. There will be an email and also a letter going out about that special worship service we have planned, hopefully together, depending on how things work out. Anyways, I don't want to delay you anymore. How about we go on to our special baptismal service? The format will be a little different maybe than what we are used to. We will first have a wonderful song. And then from the song, we'll have scripture, a short talk. Song, scripture, short talk. That's our special service format. I hope it is a blessing to you. Take care, friends. I'll see you at the first of many talks. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of the I'll be reading this morning from God's eternal word, specifically from Mark chapter 16, verses 15 to 18. If you have your Bible, you can flip there with me. I'm reading in the English Standard Version, so if you have that Bible, it'll be familiar to you. If not, I mean, they generally, I think, would read very much the same at this point. So how about we get there? Mark chapter 16, 
verses 15 to 18. I'll be reading now. And he said to them, he meaning Jesus, the risen Christ, after Christ had died and risen again, he came to his apostles and he gave them this commission. Mark's great commission, verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. What a beautiful verse. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. These marvelous signs accompanying the gift of the Holy Spirit, the working, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the lives of God's people is, is often, I think, unpreached. There is a footnote in many Bibles. There's a footnote in this Bible here, and it says that some Greek manuscripts do not have verses 9 to 20. And I just want to put that in perspective. There are about 1,650 Greek manuscripts of the gospel according to St. Mark. Of those 1,600 and about 50, there are nine which have some monkey business, some, some funniness between verses 8 and verses 9 to 20. 9 to 20 is the contested portion of this passage. And of those nine, only three, only three of over 1,600 manuscripts are actually lacking verses 9 to 20. In the Latin Bible, verses 9 to 20 were included. So we have the testimony of the early church, of the early church fathers of many, that support these verses. And we know it to be true. And we understand also, I think, very clearly, maybe why someone wouldn't want to include these verses in their Bible. That's because these are fantastical promises. These are amazing miracles. I think when we read this passage, we come face to face with the greatness of our God. There is none like him. No mind can think like him. No mind can conceive of him. And no mind is able to do the mighty acts of power that the Holy Ghost does in the life of his believers. The Bible gives an astounding promise. If anyone believes and is baptized... They will be saved. If we believe and if we obey, if we follow the teachings of Jesus and baptism is elevated to a high place, a very high place, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe, the believing is the greater part. Whoever does not believe is condemned. That's the Bible promise, the Bible statement, and the Bible fact. We serve a great and amazing and a powerful God. And before we approach this holy topic of baptism, which we are going to discuss at length, we first need to realize that we approach a great and holy, majestic and wonderful living God. God hears the very thoughts in our heads. The very actions that we do all are known by him. I don't think we can conceive of who we are dealing with. How amazing and magnificent he is. Would you pray with me as we continue our service reflecting on the majesty of our God. O Holy Father, we bless thy name. We praise and we thank you and we adore thee. Through thy Son, Jesus Christ, we thank you for his merit. The shed blood on the cross by which we have forgiveness of sins. And the Holy Ghost by whom the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And we praise and we thank thee, O Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.
If you still have your Bible with me, my friends, you can go there to Mark chapter 10, uh, verses 46 to the end of that chapter. I grabbed quite a lot of paper there. It's not, it's not so far back. We were just in Mark 16. Now we're going to Mark chapter 10. And verses 46 to the end is, is actually one of my, if not my, favorite Bible story. Bible miracle story especially of all time. It's the story of blind Bartimaeus. Before we approach this believing and baptized and then saved, we must ask, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? We often talk about believing. We talk about faith. We talk about trusting in God. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? And I want to tell you it's not an intellectual thing. It's not purely an idea. It's not just something we grasp with the mind. But it is an action of the hand, of the mouth, and of the heart. Faith. It's not just words, it's not just thoughts, but it is words, thoughts, and none are missing from pure faith. And we're going to see this here. How about you read with me Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. And they came to Jericho, and this is Jesus and the multitudes. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up. He is calling you. We put that verse on our side not that long ago. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. Rabbi means teacher. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Jesus is leaving Jericho. He's heading to Jerusalem. He's about to go to the cross. Matthew is entering us into that final time period of the life of Christ. And on this way, he meets a man by the roadside, Bartimaeus. This is what I mean by believing in Jesus. is not necessarily a purely intellectual thing. He's never seen Jesus. He has no idea what he looks like. He's a blind man. But he knows. He's been told. He's heard. And he knows this much. Jesus will help me if I call on him. If I ask Jesus to have mercy on me, Jesus is kind. And he will have mercy on me. So Bartimaeus lifts up his voice above the crowd, above the din, Above the noise. They tell him to be quiet. Be quiet, Bartimaeus. Nobody wants to hear you. Don't call on Jesus. We don't want to hear that here. You're a disturbance. But the Bible says he cries out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. If you cry out on Jesus, he will not pass you by. Jesus brought to Bartimaeus a word. He said to him, come to me. Come to me. Bring him here. And they told Bartimaeus, he is calling you. Now Bartimaeus, he could have been like, well, it's about time. He could have been like, well, it's, it's too late. I'm, I'm kind of tired. I'm not interested. I'm a little embarrassed. When Jesus said, Bartimaeus, it's time. When he heard that Jesus was calling him, he sprang up to his feet immediately. Because he knew Jesus was a great king, the son of David. Jesus was royalty. And so he treated Jesus with dignity and respect. When Jesus said, come, he came. And through his faith, which is reverence, fear, and worship, belief in Jesus, mobilizing him to action, through that faith, Jesus said to him, you are well. This morning, if you have not put your trust in Jesus, 
Or perhaps you have put your trust in Jesus, but you don't revere him as king, as Lord of your life. Would you commit your life to the Savior and ask him humbly to have mercy on you? You are coming before the great God, the almighty King, Jesus, the Lamb who was slain from before the foundation of the world, the Nazarene, the man from Galilee. Jesus is special. There is no one like him, the only son of the Father. Great, greatness is his. Do you understand what a wonderful offer the salvation call is? Would you believe in Jesus? Would you spring to your feet and obey? And put your trust in the Savior today. How about we pray? Almighty Father, we ask that you forgive us of our sins. Jesus, we hear you calling to us. And we ask that you, O Lord, would forgive us of all that we have done. That you would have mercy on us. That you would be kind to us. That you would be with us, O Lord. And help us, dear God, we pray. Forgive us all our sin and dwell in our hearts. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say the lesson there very clearly. Obedience brings blessing. Obedience brings blessing. Bartimaeus, he put his faith in Jesus and he obeyed Jesus. And through that faith, through that obedience, he received his blessing. This is a pattern of the people of God from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Faith is what the Lord is looking for. Humble hearts who believe and trust in his son, Jesus. Jesus says this himself explicitly. And we've talked a bit about believing, what it means to believe and who it is that we believe. We believe Jesus can help us if we call on him. That's Christian faith. That's Christian belief. It's that simple. If you believe Jesus will help you and can help you if you call on him, that's the starting point. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, says the Bible, will be saved. No exception. And so here, if you're willing to call on the name of the Lord, hear what Jesus is telling you to believe. The great promise of saved. Salvation. Because if we do not believe, we are condemned. That's what Mark read. But if we do believe, we are saved. We won't forget the importance of baptism. We're going to get to that. But let's talk a bit more about believing. Take a look here with me in John chapter 14. I flipped there ahead. Hope you don't mind. So maybe you need a moment to get there. We're in John chapter 14 verses 1 to 6. 
Verses 1 to 6. Those are the verses I'm going to read for you. It's the English Standard Version again. Hopefully, if you're flipping, you were able to get there from Mark. John is after Mark. I'm going to read now. Let not your hearts be troubled. Verse 1, John 14. Believe in God, believe also in me. Or believe thou in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There are two components here I want to talk about. The exclusivity of Jesus and the amazing promise of salvation. The exclusivity of Christ is that if you believe in him, you believe he alone can help. Jesus is not one help among many. He alone is the help of the soul. Nobody can do it for you. Nobody can lift you out of the mire or the clay. No one can rescue you from where you are like Jesus. And if you don't believe that, you have no business calling on him. You have to be willing to give him everything, your whole heart. Because remember, we're not coming just before the Son of Man, but the Son of God. And God is a great king. That's what the prophet Malachi tells us. Jesus is a great and almighty king. And if we trust in him, he gives us a magnificent promise. If we believe in his exclusive identity as Lord and King. The promise is that where he goes, we will follow. Jesus is not on this earth in body anymore. He has ascended to heaven to be with the Father. He has promised us that if you believe in him when you die, you're not going to go down with that old man with that body in the grave. You're going to go up. You're going to go up to an eternity with the Father. You're going to be with Christ you're going to be in his presence. And there is a city of God, a city for the soul, waiting for you. That's the Bible promise from Jesus own mouth. Would you believe it this morning, my friends? How about we pray? Almighty God, we worship thee. We adore thee. Jesus, soften our hearts to have sufficient faith to overcome fear and doubt. Have mercy on us, miserable offenders. In Christ. Jesus' name, in Christ Jesus' name, and come Holy Spirit, please. Have mercy, hover o'er us, we pray. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Fear us, Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, oh, Jesus 
If you are still tracking with me and still flipping along with me, how about we go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation, I think, is one of the easier books to find. It is at the, the back of your Bible. It is the very last book. Revelation chapter 1. I'll just be reading the first three verses. Revelation is often called the apocalypse. Apocalypse means revealing. Revelation. <laughs> that's, that's where the English title comes from. It's a revelation specifically of heaven and world history. From God's perspective, God sees everything. He sees the end. He sees where all things lead. He sees your soul. He sees where your soul will go. He sees us when we waver. He sees us in our strength. There is nothing that escapes his sight. And that's what Revelation is really all about. The sovereignty of God. That human history is in the palm of his hand. He has knowledge of it all. And he puts that knowledge to use. He interacts with us. He speaks to us. It is not a dry faith we have, as I think you can gather from Bartimaeus, but a living faith that calls on a God who responds. Faith like water that moves and flows. In Revelation chapter 1, if you've managed to make it there, at the beginning of the book, I think there's such an interesting statement that I want to take a look at there. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and then I will make mention of another verse, and then we'll be able to to talk about the significance and the importance of the moment of baptism. And not just the moment of, of baptism, but of, of many moments. Many moments. Let's take a look here. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, meaning God the Father, gave him, meaning Jesus, to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. Now, soon in Bible words can is a variable time. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and those who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. I really like verse 3. Blessed are those who read aloud, who hear the words of this prophecy. I love reading Bible in church. It brings a blessing. It brings a blessing to read the Bible out loud. I love reading the Bible out loud with my family and even by myself on occasion, although I'm still not quite 100% used to reading it out loud by myself. But reading it out loud is a wonderful experience. John here tells us that he bore witness to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, Revelation has an apocalyptic and cryptic language. The testimony of Jesus Christ. And that testimony which John bore witness to is that Jesus is the one from the Father's side, from the bosom, from the heart of the Father, from the throne, worthy of worship, God with God, Son of God, one with the Father. That's how Revelation 1 begins. It identifies Jesus as one with the Father. It's a really beautiful thing to read. You almost don't catch it if you read too fast. And then after emphasizing that identity of Jesus, it tells us this testimony over time throughout the book. I'll just pull out the summary points, not directly from the book, but in general. The testimony of Jesus is as follows. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. And now he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Catholic, that means universal, in the Holy Universal Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. That's the Apostles' Creed. It is not actually written by the Apostles, as, as far as we know. It doesn't, there's no indication to really think so. But people thought it was because it was so, so ancient. From the earliest days, Christians have been reciting this testimony of Jesus and bearing witness to it before they were baptized. In our baptismal service that we will be having, that is live right now, our candidates will be reciting, they'll be, well, they won't be reciting, but they'll be saying, I agree, I believe, to the statements in here. Christians have been using this English form of the creed for hundreds of years as they are baptized, as they go down into the water. It is the story of Jesus. It is the testimony John bore witness to. And in Revelation, you can find most, if not all, but I will, I'll settle for most, of those points in this book. This is the testimony that John is bearing witness to. And all of them are found in the Gospels. What an amazing and a wonderful truth. The Holy Spirit gets his own special section. Because there is often a lot of, I mean, I guess debate is the way, the way to put it, on his nature and on his work. John says later on here that he received this revelation, he received this understanding of heaven, of future, of Jesus' sovereignty, of the Lamb on the throne, of all of these things in the book of Revelation. He received them when he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. The Lord's day is Sunday. He was in the Spirit. He was in the Holy Ghost. He believed in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him. Baptism is a time where we confess Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Father has sent Jesus to tell you to go to the water. That's the testimony. Go to the water. Jesus has washed you by his blood, making you acceptable to the Father, and wants to dispense and to give you the Holy Spirit. And so when you are baptized, you are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we pray that in your baptism, candidates, you can't hear this, you'll be hearing me live, but we pray that the Holy Spirit will touch your heart through your faith and the blood and the water that flowed out of the side of Christ on the cross. Isn't that just the most special thing? There is nothing more wonderful than a touch of the Holy Spirit. And we hope that they have it this morning. And depending on the timeline, I mean, you could pray for them. Right now, our two candidates, one is Krista, one is David. You can pray for the both of them to receive a touch from the Holy Spirit as they walk in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyways, that's all I want to share at this point. How about we sing a song inviting the Holy Ghost to touch all of us to reveal his presence to us, his comfort, so that we in the Spirit may have a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts today. If you have your Bible, you can go with me to Psalm 51. At this point, if it was our live service, we'll have some clips to show you next week. It'll be really wonderful. We've been recording it. Uh, we have a camera, and so it'll be really wonderful to share those clips with you next week. But in our baptismal service at this point, after we've talked about the exclusivity of Jesus, the promise of heaven, the necessity of baptism, going in the water for obedience, there is more to say about baptism. We cannot move further, though, without mentioning the forgiveness of sins. Jesus, by his blood, is able to forgive us of our sins. And we have many sins. We serve not just a great God, not just a kind God, but a merciful God. There is this perception that Christians, people in church, are perfect people. That is not the case. We are saints, and a saint is a sinner saved by grace. Not on account of what I've done, but on account of what Jesus did. Not because my blood is red, 
but because Christ bled red from the cross. It's not in the food I eat. It's in the body that was broken for me and the blood shed on that tree. Jesus paid the price of death, which every person deserves for the wages of sin is death, says the word of God. We serve a great God. The wages of sin is death. Jesus paid that price so that God's mercy could be extended to everybody who believes. And that's a magnificent and a wonderful promise. And that's been through the Bible from forever. That God is a forgiver of sins. Ain't that the best thing you ever heard? God is a forgiver of sins. I want us to read a passage here from Psalm 51. Oh, I'm already there. It's, it's one of the most famous passages. We're going to read the first eight verses. And then after we read those eight verses, I'm going to invite us to close our eyes. And I'm going to recite for us the ten commandments. We are all guilty of breaking these. I'm going to contextualize them so we can understand them in our context today. And as we reflect on that, we should feel, hopefully, the weight of our sin. And then realize the depth of God's love. First, I want us to see the words of a sinful man calling to God for help, who receives forgiveness by washing. Washing only the way Jesus can wash. Take a look here. Psalm 51, verses 1 to 8, the English Standard Version. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. When we feel the weight of our sin, guilt, the Lord doesn't want us to feel that. But we can feel it when we know that we've sinned against a great, kind, and merciful God. Sin is a special word. It invokes feelings of shame, feelings of pain. But we need not feel them. But we should acknowledge the great love of Jesus that has set us free from the weight of our sin, heavy enough to break bones. And these bones, healed by the blood of Jesus, can definitely, 100%, rejoice. Would you close your eyes in contemplation for a moment, reflecting, my sin. My transgression is ever before me. Reflect for a moment on your sin. I'm going to bring to remembrance some sins that I think many of us are guilty of. All of us have broken at one point or another. The first commandment is to have no other gods before God. Are we guilty of revering, of putting our trust, our reverence, our fear, our worship, our hope in any one? or anything other than the living God. If we are guilty of such a thing, the weight of it will break our bones. The second commandment is thou shalt have no graven image. We are not to have a false depiction of who God is. It is not enough to believe in God. There is an appropriate image. And that image, the only image, is Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. Have we called on the Father through any other name than Jesus? What a sin. There is only one way to the Father, Jesus Christ. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. This is the third commandment. Who among us is not guilty of treating lightly the holy and sacred name of Almighty God, of not giving Him proper worship, reverence, of not giving Him his due. Remember the Sabbath day, the fourth commandment, to keep it holy. Man was ordered by God to dedicate our days to him. Jesus tells us every day is a Sabbath. Every day is a day of worship to Almighty 
God. The fifth command is to honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. It is the first command with a promise. Who among us as children or even adults have not given our parents the due reverence for the kindness and the good they have done to us? Some of us perhaps are not blessed with good parents. However, all parents are from the Lord and are to be honored as father and as mother for giving us life. Our life is owed to them. You shall not murder. This is the sixth commandment. No man has the right to take the life of another man. Dear God, I hope none of us are guilty of such a sin. But if we are, there is grace and blood sufficient to cover even that. You shall not commit adultery. The Lord commands us that one man and one woman for life. That is his plan. We are not to break that vow or to have union with another outside of that sacred relationship. Lord, forgive us. Indeed, it was not guilty of lust, which Jesus extends to even adultery. You shall not steal. This is the eighth commandment. We are not to take things that are not ours. Have we robbed the government? Have we robbed friends? Robbed family? We are so often guilty of robbery, theft. Thank God we have a merciful God. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So often we gossip. So often we say things about others that are not true. We misrepresent people to another. Lord, have mercy on us. Help us to bridle our tongues. He who does not bridle his tongue, his religion, is worthless. You shall not covet, whether it is your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his male or his female servant, his ox or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Who is not guilty of covetousness, of greed, seeing things that are not ours, and wanting them, desiring them for our own. Lord, help us. God, have mercy on our souls. Lord Jesus, we just ask that you forgive us of all the sins we have committed, that you would be kind to us, and we know you are kind and merciful. Thank you so much for your love and care. We are not perfect people. We are sinners saved by grace. We praise and we thank thee, O Lord, that just by calling on you, we shall be saved. We worship thee, ever one God, three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. It is at this point in our service for uh, our baptismal candidates, I would call them up to receive prayer from an elder of the church that the Lord would touch them, send his Holy Spirit to anoint them for their baptism. Jesus commands us to do it. He tells us we are to be baptized. It's his command. Anyone who believes and is baptized is saved. That's very, very important. What a wonderful thing. At this point, if we were in the live service, I'd call the candidates to come on up. I'd have Art come and pray for them, and we would ask the Holy Spirit to touch them. Why do we ask the Holy Spirit specifically to touch people in baptism, like I've been saying over and over again? Now, baptism is immersion. That's what the verb baptize means. Go down in the water, come up. Full covering. Because the whole of us is saved. Not the part, but the whole. So the whole man, the whole woman, the whole whoever must be covered in water. When we go down in that water, though, and when we come up, we should have a hope in our heart that the Holy Spirit will alight on us and touch us. Jesus, when he was baptized in Matthew chapter 3, he went down into the water. And when he came up, the Holy Spirit came to him and said, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. Those who believe in Jesus are called children. Children. When you go down in the water and you come up, you want the Holy Spirit to speak to you. You are a child of the living God. You want to be touched in your heart that you are one who has trusted and obeyed in the Holy Father, the Holy Son, and the Holy Ghost. What an amazing and wonderful God we serve. We are going to have just a song for us at this point, and then we will go to our time of communion. After the baptismal candidates come up and they're prayed for, there will be some singing. 
and then communion. We unfortunately can't do all of that, just me in the basement, but we can definitely have a song and we can definitely have communion in a moment. How about we have a wonderful song of worship to our amazing God? It is now time for communion. I hope you have your juice and your, your cracker. I have a wafer here. Righty, we're going to partake of it together. Communion is a celebration. It is a culmination of the deliverance of God's people. It is a symbol of the body and the blood of the Lord. A symbol he himself consecrated and sanctified. When he gave bread and juice to his apostles and he said, the fruit of the vine, that's what he gave them. He gave it to them and he said, take and eat. There is no one else who has given their flesh or their blood for the life of the world. Jesus says in John's gospel, no greater love has man than this. Then he laid down his life for his friend. In offering his flesh and his blood, he is laying down the fullness of his life because he calls us friends. Jesus is not just the great, kind, and merciful God. He loves you. Communion is that pledge and that promise. 
the fullness of his love for you to hold and feel and experience and to reflect on. If I was to pick one thing that all the Bible revolves around, it's very easy. It's the cross. It's the cross. Nothing else compares to that mountain on Calvary. Moses received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, that big old mountain where God appeared and revealed his name in a way like never before. Really, all the Old Testament revolves around that powerful and amazing moment in Exodus. But that moment, the law came through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. That amazing moment where the mountain smoked and trembled and the earthquake was just a leading up. It was just a foreshadow, a foretaste of the forgiveness of sins offered by Jesus' death on the cross. His shed blood. We sing about the blood at this church because there's nothing else that will make you white. There's nothing else that can make you clean except the blood of the Lamb. And that's a marvelous thing. It's the love of God, the liquid love of God for us. So how about... We just have a moment to pray, prepare our hearts, and we'll just partake of this. And then I'll dismiss you, my friends. O Lord Jesus, we come before the only Son of the Father, one who gives the Holy Spirit to those who believe. We trust in you. You are the rotating point of our worship and our adoration of Almighty God. We thank thee, Father, that you have elevated Jesus to the highest place. Jesus, we elevate you. To the highest place. Forgive us our sins. May we partake with thee together in Jesus' name. Would you have these ready with me? Take them in your hands. And let me read to you now from 1 Corinthians. Sorry there, I just missed my place. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26. The English Standard Version. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And we had given thanks, he broke it. And said, this is my body. Thank you, Lord, for this body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you partake of this pledge of friendship this morning? In Jesus' name. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant. In my blood, thank you, Lord, for this new covenant that supersedes the old, that fulfills it for this cup of blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you partake of this with me this morning? For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Until he comes. Well, friends, what a wonderful Sunday it has to be. It is, it is very difficult <laughs> for me to prepare these. I hope it is not difficult for you to follow the special services, digging through all the passages and connecting them. It's, it's such a pleasure. It's such a joy. But sometimes I feel a little scattered. I hope it all connected. The importance of baptism, that going down in the water being touched by the Holy Ghost, the necessity of faith for salvation, and the necessity of believing in the right God in the right way, to fear Him and love Him and honor Him as Lord of your life. I won't give a benediction. I'll just give a simple blessing. I don't want to go too long. It is a special service. But I want you to know, friends, the Lord loves you, and you're blessed. You, my friends, are blessed. Jesus has pronounced the blessing. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you humble yourself to be like a child, he's given you a Bible promise. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Take care, friends. Have a wonderful week. And God bless. Go in peace. The peace and the fellowship and the love of Almighty God the Father the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit.
Take care, my friends. Bye.